Okay, World War I is over and everything is puppies and rainbows. And by puppies and rainbows, I mean generalized economic disaster worldwide that'll play a big role in whipping up yet another world war. So let's talk about it. And if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. And with all the economic crises that we're gonna consider in this video, what you really need to focus on is how governments got involved in trying to solve those crises. And just for poops and giggles, why don't we start with Germany because they had it in a bad way. Now you might remember that the Treaty of Versailles required Germany to pay reparations for the damage that they caused, which ended up being a, a lot of money. Money. Additionally, Germany put most of their war spending on their credit card, so to speak. And they assumed that by winning the war and annexing resource-rich lands, they were going to be able to pay that back. But as it turned out, the winning the war part of the equation didn't work out so well. And that means Germany, in addition to paying reparations, was into debt up to their German nose hairs. And so in the face of such crushing expectations, the German government did what any rational government would do, they started printing more money. And when that happened, the value of the German mark plummeted precipitously, and that led the German economy into something called hyperinflation. Let me try to illustrate to you just how bad it got. You know how when you go to another country you have to exchange your money in order to get their money? Well, by November of 1923, if I went to Germany with one dollar in my hand and went to exchange it, I would have gotten back 4.2 trillion marks. Like in 1922, a German could buy a loaf of bread for 160 marks, but by 1923, that same loaf of bread cost 200 billion marks. <laughs> That's a lot of marks, Tony. Now, this hyperinflation situation didn't only affect Germany. Remember, they owed money to powers like Britain and France in the form of reparations. But when Germany couldn't pay them, Britain and France struggled to repay their own war debts to the United States. Add to that, the Soviets weren't paying back their war debts either because they went ahead and had a communist revolution and decided that old debts didn't belong to the new Bolshevik government. Additionally, colonial governments suffered too because they had come to depend on the economies of their parent countries. And so colonial governments in Africa, Asia, and Latin America all got thrown into this giant economic turd stew. And as my grandpappy used to say, once there's a turd in the stew, ain't nobody gonna eat it. Oh, and by the way, if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, you might wanna check out my AP World Heimler Review Guide. It's the fastest way to study for all the required elements of this course, and it just might make all your dreams come true. And that link is in the description. Anyway, long story short, by 1924, the economic situation was stabilized and Germany borrowed money from US banks in order to make their reparations payments to Britain and France. And that led to the rapid economic recovery of all involved. To which I say, phew, I really hope another worldwide economic collapse isn't looming on the horizon to put the kibosh on all that stability. <laughs> You know, foreshadowing. But for now, let's head over to the Soviet Union and see how their economic situation is fair. Now, remember that Russia had exited World War I during the Russian Revolution of 1917, but not before their involvement in the war kind of devastated their economy. And so, in response, Vladimir Lenin got the new communist government involved and instituted the new economic policy in 1923. Now, in essence, this introduced some limited free market principles into the Soviet economy, even while the biggest institutions remained under state control. Now, to be clear, free market was a dirty word in the Soviet Union. Like, if this video was being played in the Soviet Union during the 1920s, they probably censored me when I said free market. But Lenin allowed himself to get a little dirty in the filth of capitalism because he needed the economic breathing room to complete the communist revolution. Anyway, there was some limited success with the new economic policy, but Lenin went ahead and died in 1924, and those economic policies kind of died with him. But don't worry, because in his place, the authoritarian turd Joseph Stalin assumed power, and he would get all kinds of involved with the economy. You see, Stalin wanted the Soviet Union to industrialize quick, fast, and in a hurry. And to that end, he introduced a series of five year plans which aimed to multiply Soviet industrial capacity by five in as many years. Now, that was a very short time period for such large goals, and the only way to accomplish it was with a strong-armed state bent on brutality, which, as it turned out, was Stalin's specialty. Therefore, in order to supply the newly created and rapidly growing industrial centers with food, Stalin enacted a collectivization of agriculture. And this involved merging small, privately owned farms into large, sprawling collective farms owned by the state. And nearly all of the produce of the land would be shipped to feed industrial workers in the city. Now, the wealthy landowning class known as the Kulaks resisted this collectivization bitterly. But Stalin ordered them arrested to the tune of about 8 million and either executed them or sent them to hard labor camps. And after that, all that was left was the peasantry who did not possess the managerial skills of the Kulaks and therefore were unable to match production quotas set by the state. And nowhere were the effects of this collectivization felt more acutely than in Ukraine, which was by far the most significant producer of grain in the whole Soviet Union. So the 1932-33 harvest was only about half of what it had been in the years before. But Stalin's obsession with feeding industrial centers meant that even what Ukrainian farmers did produce was exported to feed urban workers. And that left them with almost no food for themselves, and Stalin's policies prohibited them from leaving their homes, which turned out to be a death sentence. The result was that millions starved to death, and the event became known as the Holodomor, or death by hunger. Okay, so yeah, things are a little rough, economically speaking, across the world. But the one bright glimmer of hope in all this darkness was the booming economy of the United States that was helping prop up a lot of other economies recovering from World War I. But then in 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed, which plunged America into the Great Depression. However, since several European economies were reliant on investment 
from America in order to rebuild after World War I, the U.S.'s inability to continue that funding meant that the Great Depression would become a worldwide phenomenon. Now, for many years, the U.S. government was very hands-off with respect to the economy, but the mounting woes of the Great Depression changed all of that, uh, big time. And that occurred under the freshly elected president named Franklin D. Roosevelt, who worked quickly to roll out hundreds of government-sponsored policies that combined became known as the New Deal. And under the New Deal, the government put people to work on infrastructure projects, introduced a government-sponsored retirement program, created government medical insurance for the elderly and for children, and on and on. And whether it would have worked to turn the economy around is up for debate, because by 1939, World War II would break out and solve all the U.S.'s economic hardships almost overnight. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 7, and click here to grab my AP World Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. I appreciate you coming around, and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.